breast milk science. It's a thing, and it's our thing. We're by heart. Our mission is simple. Make the best infant formula in the world. We partnered with breast milk scientists, world-class doctors, and passionate parents to write a new recipe from scratch. Our patented protein blend includes two of the most abundant proteins in breast milk at levels closer to the real thing. We're also the first U.S.-made infant formula to use organic grass-fed whole milk, not skim. And we ran the largest clinical trial by a new infant formula company in 25 years, proving benefits like less spit-up, softer poops, and easier digestion versus a leading infant formula. And while we've put a lot into Byheart, there's a long list of things you won't see on our ingredient list, like corn syrup, soy, or palm oil. Curious if Byheart is right for your baby? New customers can shop the starter pack and get two cans for the price of one at byheart.com slash get started. That's one free can at B-Y-H-E-R-T dot com slash get started. This is a limited time offer. Additional terms and conditions apply. Try it risk free. That's the Buy Heart promise. You ever seen a ghost? Been abducted? Heard your name whispered from the other room when you're all alone? No, you say? Me either. But if you're like me, you're still fascinated by the paranormal. It seems everyone else has had an experience, and you want to believe it all. So why doesn't it happen to us? What does it all mean? How does it work? Is any of it real? Welcome to Paranorm Girl, a show that will attempt to answer these questions by taking the paranormal completely apart in search of proof. I'm not a blind believer, nor a hardened skeptic. I'm just looking for answers and willing to accept what I find. Demonology is a tricky subject to examine. Just want you all to know that before we kick off this episode. A few months back, I was lucky enough to be gifted with a mountain of very, very old literature all pertaining to the demonic, to the satanic, and really any peripheral subjects that you could possibly imagine. A mountain. Upon going through this treasure trove in search of suitable information about demonology, I formed a few observations, and here they are. Jesus Christ, men be talkin'. What the hell, yo? Get to the point. You've published a 400-page manuscript specifically titled History of Demonology. History of Demonology. And I'm sitting here, three hours in, reading about your roommate from university, who at first striking you as a stubborn fellow, you now couldn't be more fond of his inquisitive mind and most exquisite corporeal composition. His disposition truly is a delight to the supernaturally skeptic, yet somehow God-fearing mind of yore. We get it. Where's the demon stuff? Second, demonology was considered intrinsically married to witchcraft. If you're reading anything written before the 19th century, you can probably bet your buttered biscuits that the man who wrote it believed witches and the demonic were a cause-and-effect snake eating its own tail. And finally, just like with demons, no one seems to be able to agree on what demonology really is. We do have our modern interpretation now, which we shall focus on, but looking back over the centuries, demonology itself seemed to be this all-inclusive concept, an umbrella covering most, if not all, aspects of the supernatural, something only fallible and disgruntled men would research, and only those tormented by disease and mental illness could experience. Today, it is a study, a practice and even a profession. Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. This is the last in-depth look on the subject of demons and possession before the season finale, folks. If you haven't gathered yet, we are talking about demonology and its experts today. I am so ready for the new season, y'all. I have enjoyed this one quite a bit, truly. But it never fails. Come end of season, I start Jones, and man, I need the fix of a big finish and a new beginning. And of course, new knowledge and another piece added to this gigantic paranormal puzzle. I've had Halloween on my mind. It's so far away. 
I know, but already brainstorming ideas for what I want to do this year. Last year, I did the scariest paranormal games you shouldn't play, and that kicked big, big booty, putting that all together. I had so much fun with the music and learning the games and weaving the creepiness together and ultimately freaking myself out. Really enjoyed that one. So feeling the need to uh, top it this next go around. In that vein, I announced my partnering with Wicked Cat Clothing a few weeks back. Just got an awesome shirt from them. You might have seen it on the socials. If you follow the show, it says Ghost Whisperer across the front. And I wear that thing everywhere. Always get a ton of compliments. And it's been a really great conversation starter, which is good, especially for a para-podcaster looking to have those types of conversations. If you like spooky, paranormal, horror apparel, if you like Halloween as much as I do, you should check out her website. I'll link it in the notes, and you can save 30% when you plug in the code paranormgirl30. So, check them out. Go get you some cool new threads. I'll have an exciting announcement near the end of the show, so please hang around for that. You won't want to miss it, but let's go ahead and get into our topic. Simply put, demonology is the study of demons and the beliefs people have about them. The catch here is that demonology specifically looks at this information via a theological-based viewpoint. So, Demonology generally does not consider demons to be entities without a foundation in the Bible and other religious texts and grimoires. Without religion, demons would not exist. Or would they? And simply be called something else? That is my question. Now, does a demonologist necessarily have to be a person of faith? Can it be studied in spite of the theology that supports it by those who do not subscribe to an organized religion? Yes, of course it can. Can that person be considered a demonologist? I'm sure of it. Ed Simon wrote a book called Pandemonium, A Visual History of Demonology. Ed himself is not a believer of a literal being called a demon, not existing within our base reality anyway. He takes more of a literary metaphorical, poetic stance on the subject. But with all of the self-education on the matter, the knowledge he has gained inside and out about the history, the etiology, the varieties across the world, would it not be fair, if he wanted it so, to call him a demonologist? He's well-versed on the subject and has studied demons and the beliefs that people have about them. And this brings me to my next point. How does one become a demonologist? Is it really as simple as studying the topic, becoming well informed on it, intimately familiar with it, and then giving yourself the title? Well, yeah, kind of. You can very well study and learn every single thing you can about it, and depending on your reasoning for that, call yourself a demonologist. You can do it for your own interest or ego, if you wish, just to feel good about the knowledge and the title. Or, as we might already suspect, most who become well-known as demonologists become so for the distinct purpose of battling the demonic and helping people. In that way, every exorcist who performs major exorcisms are already demonologists. I've seen a lot of paranormal investigation teams with demon experts. There is something called demonolatry, which is a take on the subject of demons that we didn't discuss at length during the season. I mentioned it briefly in passing early on, but just as another example here of where someone might distinctly be able and want to call themselves a demonologist might possibly be seen in demonolatry, which is the worship of demonic entities. And before you recoil with the thought that people are out there specifically worshipping evil entities, that's just not always the case. Most of the groups and threads I have sneaky sneaky been a part of, the sense I get is more so a communal understanding that these figures have been misunderstood and vilified throughout history, very much so considered in the same way as ancient cultures might have looked at them, not as evil and malevolent, but rather as powerful idols and spiritual entities who can assist, guide, protect, and empower, depending on their areas of control and strength. Very, very similar to how Catholics might pray to certain saints for help with particular problems and situations. 
Demonology is not, as of yet, something you would specifically earn a college degree in, though there is a small list of various online or metaphysical and religious study programs you can enroll in if you're looking for a more structured way to learn the subject. In 2017, Texas State University was offering a course as part of their religious studies minor program. Online, you can enroll in the University of Metaphysics that offers a variety of certificates on special interests like demonology. Paralearning.org offers a certificate in modern demonology for paranormal investigators for only 42 bucks, dudes. And I'm, I'm actually thinking about taking it. I don't know how good it is, but the details they lay out for the course look like really great information. So there are some choices out there if that is the way one wants to go. But ultimately, at the end of the day, all you really need to study demonology and be able to call yourself a demonologist is an open mind and a willingness to learn about demons. Now, what if you want to make it your vocation? Well, you can, such as the following demonologists have done. First and foremost, Ed and Lorraine Warren the most famous demonologist duo in history. Though Ed was the self-taught and self-professed demonologist of the team, Lorraine, who was clairvoyant and a medium, worked with him side by side on such well-known demonic haunting cases as Annabelle, the Perrin family home haunting, the possession and trial of Arnie Johnson, and the Snedeker house. The Warrens were Roman Catholic and brought their faith to all of their investigations. They would actually hold that demonic forces were likely to possess those who lacked faith. It should be noted the criticism this couple has received. Before I launch into it, though, I just want to say this about the Warrens. Without their body of work, their books, and their shedding of a very public light onto cases of ghostly and demonic activity— I doubt interest in the paranormal would be as high as it is today. Some of you might think that high level is a bad thing. Some of you might think it's good. I happen to be in the latter group. It's a good thing to be aware of these cases and findings, to be aware of the phenomena, and to examine and question it. What they did and what they have left behind is a diving board for so many involved in this field today. For better or worse, there was a reignition of the subject of ghosts, hauntings, demons, poltergeists, possession, good, evil, psychic abilities, and paranormal investigating in general. They were very much a part of lighting that spark. But yes, they received their fair share of criticism and skepticism and expose-type reporting and articles. Though on numerous occasions they were often reported to be a nice couple and genuinely sincere people, the evidence they have collected has been called blarney, the artifacts they've collected nothing but unaffected objects, photos they took of supposed entities the result of errors made with flash photography, and their reportedly scientific evidence and methods with investigating called untestable. Furthermore, they certainly told a lot of what the Sydney Morning Herald would call the fish that got away stories where unfortunately no proof was collected. And many skeptics have concluded that cases like Amityville, as we've discussed, and the Snedeker haunting were both total fabrications and have also pointed to the monetary gain the Warrens made with the publishing of books on their more famous cases. There's always going to be another side and skew to a story, and anything can be ripped apart and put under the microscope. But as far as the field of demonology goes, the vocation and execution of it, though I myself find a lot of the skepticism about their evidence and investigations valid, um, I, I still have a lot of respect for the Warrens. John Zaffis became interested in demonology at a very early age. He learned about it from his aunt and uncle, Ed and Lorraine Warren. From that early involvement in the study of this subject, he became involved with various possessions and exorcism cases and worked with many prominent exorcists, including Malachi Martin and Bishop Robert McKenna. 
while John admittedly was a skeptic of the paranormal until the age of 16, when he saw something he deemed undeniable, an apparition of what he learned to be his late grandfather. His career in this field has taken him onto many TV and movie sets, lectures at universities and libraries, and the running of his own paranormal museum. Now, both Rosemary Ellen Guiley and Michelle Belanger would qualify as demonologists, or at at the very least, demon experts. To my knowledge, neither of them identify exclusively as such. I spoke extensively about Ms. Guiley as an expert on shadow people in the first season. Unfortunately, she did pass away just a few years ago, and though it was a loss to the paranormal field, the body of work that she left behind is incredible and thorough. One of her books, The Encyclopedia of Demons and Demonology, is cited as one of the most concise and best-selling books on the topic of demons and was a big reference for a lot of the information you've heard this season. An angle that she took with shadow people and that has been connected to the study of the demonic as well is the jinn. She was able to connect a lot of paranormal experiences and ET encounters to the jinn, and her work and study of this entity tends to make a lot of sense to someone trying to fit supernatural pieces together, such as myself. Like I said way at the beginning of this journey, I don't know enough about the jinn to make that connection for myself quite yet. Um... I shall include it as a subject in a future season and do my due diligence. It's an interesting topic and deserves further exploration. Michelle Belanger is an occult expert, educator, and author of over 30 books on paranormal and supernatural topics. Michelle wrote a few books on demons, but the one I particularly love and purchased and used for research is their Dictionary of Demons. This book includes over a thousand names and histories for each entry, and a lot of in-depth informational excerpts sprinkled throughout the entire volume. If this subject interests you, this is personally one of the best compilations on the demonic I've ever read, and I encourage anyone to add it to their library. From an early age, Michelle had encounters and experiences with spirits. This led to an avid fascination and research on the paranormal. Michelle has become one of the most informed and well-researched experts alive today on the occult, vampires, psychics, magic, and demons. Adam Christian Bly is a therapist and demonologist that Rosemary Ellen Guiley wrote a section on in her Encyclopedia of Demons and Demonology. Experiencing hypnopompic and hypnagogic dreams early in life got him interested in meditation, shamanism, and other mystical experiences, which then led to an interest in psychology and research of brain structure and function, hypnosis, and clinical psychology. Bly's specific work within the paranormal field began when he started advising for a university-based paranormal club, which then led to a connection with the Roman Catholic Church. From there, he became an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists in Rome and has spoken on demonology, possession, and exorcism. He provides training for exorcists nationally, has his master's in psychology, and currently works full-time for the Pittsburgh Diocese. Adam is a really great example, though, coming at demonology from a religious viewpoint— of someone who, by all accounts, seems to be a grounded fellow, keeping one foot in science and logic while the other is firmly planted in the paranormal. Now, I'm going to do shorter descriptions for these next few demonologists of old because I want to give them their due credit, but we'll also need to wrap at some point. Francesco Maria Guazzo, often credited as the first ever demonologist, was an Italian priest from the 17th century. He wrote something called the Compendium Maleficarum, which was a handbook for recognizing witches and also a classification of demons. In his time, he was highly regarded in the field of possessions and curses. Colin de Plancy, I mentioned him in the history episode, was an occultist and demonologist who most notably wrote something called the Dictionnaire Infernal in 1818. This cataloged and illustrated a lot of various demonic entities, including some pretty impressive artistic representations. As you might recall, Asmodeus had the breast of a man, chicken legs, a snake tail, and three heads. 
It's a pretty well-known rendering. You should check it out. Interestingly, a demon named Zozo does appear in this book, though its connection to the well-known Ouija board demon of our modern times is unverifiable. And it's curious where de Plancy even got it from, as there are no references to a demon named Zozo prior to the publishing of his list. Next up, Montague Summers. He was eccentric, and he's got the headshot to prove it. I'm... Seriously, you you need to go look up Montague Summers on Google and tell me that that man is not cuckoo. Like, why? What's with the like, why? Why your hair got to be like that, dude? I'm not poking at him because he was eccentric. No, I, I like eccentric. I understand eccentric. I'm poking at him because the guy was a creep. Call it a gut feeling. But also because of this stuff. Summers became well-known after publishing a book called History of Witchcraft and Demonology in 1926. In the introduction to the series his book was published under, he wrote, In the following pages, I have endeavored to show the witch as she really was, an evil liver, a social pest and parasite, the devotee of a loathly and obscene creed, adept at poisoning, blackmail, and other creeping crimes, a member of a powerful secret organization, a blasphemer in word and deed, swaying the villagers by terror and superstition, a charlatan, an abortionist, a minister to vice and inconceivable corruption, battening upon the filth and foulest passions of the age." He also published the first English version of Malleus Maleficarum, which is a handbook from the 15th century about how to hunt witches. Creep, yo. Summers firmly believed in Satanism as the evil of all evils, describing its nefarious nature with tremendous gusto. His already medieval ideas about witches, witchcraft, demons, and how to go about violently dealing with such took on a more paranoid and conspiracy-driven Tang as he grew older and continued to write into the 30s and 40s. As well-known and as extreme as his work and opinions were, his Wikipedia profile states, and I believe rightly so, that his materials may have helped to influence the satanic panic that evolved in 1980. All right, saving the best for last, because it's just so cool and something you youngins might relate to. Sarabjit Mohanty. So, I'll be honest, I'd never heard of this demonologist before. He came up in an article listing out some well-known demonologists, so I took a look, and I think it's kind of awesome. Sarabjit claims to be India's only certified demonologist, and the world's youngest. This article is from 2018, when he was just 20 years old, so it's possible someone younger has come along in that time to scoop up the title. I just haven't come across that info yet. He founded the Parapsychology and Investigations Research Society in 2016, which at the time was the only society that researched parapsychology in India. Along with the members of his group, he investigates reports of paranormal activity, black magic, and witchcraft in numerous locations across his country. I do love the way he approaches each of their cases with skepticism. He says that when they investigate, the very first step is to take readings of EMF, carbon monoxide levels, and research the distance of these reportedly haunted or affected locations from electrical grids, which all of that is understood to cause people to hallucinate and can lead to belief that a paranormal experience is taking place. But he covers his bases, too, as his team also recruits psychics and spiritual healers because he doesn't deny the existence or the possibility of the paranormal. It is only once they have done that first level of investigation and cannot come up with a logical explanation that they then employ metaphysical cleansing and healing for the spirits and the location. He says the whole point of his team's work is not to spread superstition, but to bust it claiming that out of every 10 cases they receive, nine are logically explained. But he's holding space for the unexplained, which I try to do as well, so I, I can appreciate his approach to it all. I can't agree more with this quote, which I'm pulling from an article interview with him from the LogicalIndian.com page. 
I want people to have an open mind, at least, and keep a possibility that anything could happen. The universe is ever-expanding, so a thing we don't know now might reveal itself at some time. Having an open mind will make it easy to accept. Otherwise, you start resisting it, and when you start doing that, you start harming yourself and everyone else. Sounds like a cool dude with a level-headed, skeptically open-minded approach. And as a demonologist, he certainly has a good foundation to build his investigations upon. So there you go. Demonologists and demonology and what to do with it and what has been done with it. I think I'm going to sign up for that para-learning class. Dudes, like, uh, should I? Should I? I, I have a pretty decent understanding of a lot of this stuff by now, but it would bug me forever not knowing what I might have missed or gotten all wrong. Anyway, that's it, folks. Uh, that, that's all I've got for you today on this, the final lesson on demons and possession. I have been revving up and reviewing all that I have uncovered to form my official conclusion and opinion, thought I had a good place to land on all of this, and then... In the final hour, an exorcist extended an olive branch. Universe, why do you do this to me, hmm? I will be interviewing Archbishop Plato Angelakis for the conversation series and squeezing our discussion in for both your and my education before the season finale. Father Angelakis is an ordained Catholic priest and active member of the American Association of Exorcists. So, suffice it to say... I think he knows a thing or two about this here subject of demons and possession. I'm incredibly excited about this one because aside from some of the more trippy and fear-mongering comments I have received for four months straight, no biggie, not once have I been approached by someone who actually has a professional and theologically intimate knowledge of this topic until now. Not sure why that is the case. I've been here. I'm open to having the conversation. I know I have RBF, but I'm always careful to give y'all smiling pictures on the socials. What gives? Jokes aside, thank you, Plato. I'm really looking forward to it, sir. If that episode piques your interest, if you enjoyed this episode or any episode ever, rate and review the show. Love you guys. Smooch, smooch. Follow the show on the socials at Paranorm Girl Pod. You can always reach me at the email, paranormgirlpod at gmail.com or the submission page on the website. Can you guess what it is? Can you? Paranormgirlpod.com, y'all. Smooch, smooch. I think I got it all in this time. Did I get it all in? Let me see. Here we go. Yep, yep, and yep. Nope. Oh, I will get that one next time. We're done here. That's a little snippet of my internal nonstop dialogue, folks. You're welcome. Time for a final note. Demonology is a vocation, an education, a calling. A lot of people have taken on this title and in turn used it to varying degrees, to save others, to harm others, to warn and educate others, or themselves. But is it dangerous? I don't mean the application of it, I mean the actual study itself. Is it dangerous to learn about demons? I mean, so far so good on my end. Or, Maybe it's only dangerous for some people, those without faith to protect them, those with addictive tendencies or dark energy or who have committed sin. Still all good over here. I was talking with a coworker recently. I don't know him all that well, but if you ask me what I'm into, I am ready to power my way through an in-detail, beginning-to-end summation and PowerPoint presentation of my show and why I do it, because it's something I'm passionate about. But when I started talking about the research for this season, I felt the energy shift a little bit. He did continue to listen quietly, I will give him that, but when I was done, he told me, I really shouldn't be messing with this stuff and that I should be more careful. It's nothing I haven't heard before. 
but this time it was like uh, just a punch to the gut. I asked him if the demonic is really the source of all evil and has the deepest, darkest hatred of us and all that is good, and they are willing to commit their entire existence to this animosity, there must be a good reason for it. Why this level of evil? What is the actual motivation for this amount of hatred? Why? He said, if you knew that judgment day was coming and you were going to be exterminated, wouldn't you be so angry? Wouldn't you hate and try to hurt as many people as you could on your way out? And I said, no, (laughs) absolutely not. In fact, I know without a doubt I would react the exact opposite. Why would anyone waste the precious time they had left feeling and acting that way? But but that, that is just me. My reaction is beside the point I'm, I'm trying to make here with you, the listener, about demonology and the pursuit of this off-limits information. An education should never be off-limits. But this has been a hard-won uphill battle from the start, not because of some unseeable demonic forces trying to derail my discoveries and enlightenment, or trying to cash in on my ignorant, ripe-for-the-picking soul, but because of people and their fear. And if I'm being honest, my own fear as well. But my fear came from a genuine place of not understanding something I was told to be afraid of, wanting to understand it, to know if there was actually anything to it, continuing to live a very normal, basic reality contrary to what was supposedly going to happen to me, and yet at every turn, consistently goaded to question whether everyone who had ever told me to be careful and that I didn't know what I was messing with was somehow right. Some listening right now might sincerely believe that demons don't need to get me because I'm already got, right? I'm, I'm no threat to them. Okay. But what about at the beginning of this journey when I didn't know anything and had yet to form an opinion on whatever I would expose? Maybe I was still no threat then, because they already knew there would be nothing for me to find. Stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.